Welcome back, everyone. I'm here with no other than Frank Shapiro, the editor at large at The Plot, the man, the myth, the legend, CT influencer, number one. How are you doing, my man? I think there's a few people that would rank above me, but I appreciate the you're flattery. Up there. You are up Thank there. Thank you, sir. Got to I'm doing good. This is incredible. I mean, I've never, I've never been in such a nice studio here in Miami. This is incredible. Thank you so much. The offices are great. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to chat with with another legend in his own respect. Thank you so Mr. much, Mr. Felix brother. Hartman. Thanks so much. Yeah. So this is like going to be a crossover. Like, remember those? Well, you're from Germany. I don't know. Oh. If Nickelodeon existed it, it over did. there. Yeah, we had. But do you remember Disney. those crossover episodes where like oh, Timmy Turner would yes. go on Jimmy Neutron? That's what this kind of is. Right. Or like for the for the new kids, it's like the MCU. You know, like the Marvel Universe with all these different characters coming together. Yeah, exactly. I love it. Well, for those who don't know you yet, you're one of the leading journalists in the, in the crypto space. And before crypto, you were also at Business Insider, NASDAQ, and you even were on public radio. And in today's episode, I really want to dive deep into kind of like the truth in media, because there's been, I think all the talk in the last few weeks has been about what's been going on FTX and also the massive discrepancy of what we're perceiving in the industry and what is being painted towards the public. Um, but before we get into that, maybe we can give a quick backstory on like, you know, a like how we got to the journalism world and then also your journey into crypto and what that's been like evolving from the early days of virtually no mass media coverage to today where you can't pass an hour without it being on Bloomberg. Yeah. Um, so I started uh, my, my journalism career really uh, in college where I did public radio. At the time, I was covering more local politics, local New York City politics. And it was, it was you know, what you would expect. I'd go on at the top of the hour at Anchor the News, three-minute rundown of what was happening in the city, the country, and the broader world. Uh, for a smallish station, I mean a couple hundred thousand listeners a day, probably. Mm -hmm. um, and then I did some internships in finance, and I thought that that would be where I would wind up. But... Mm -hmm. I couldn't really land a job, which is which is not a good thing. So I settled to work in business Crypto. journalism. <laughs> yeah. I guess uh, you know those who cannot do can write about mm -hmm. it. And so it it didn't take that long for me to sort of like build a really nice network and yeah. book of relationships. Um, since the team was so nimble and so small, um, I think at the time we had 15 folks on the finance team. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty much eat what you can kill. And my beat was probably one of the more esoteric, esoteric beats on, on Wall Street, which is market structure and trading infrastructure. Yep. So there wasn't a lot of uh, competition, as it were, internally to cover those topics because they were they weren't as sexy as like wealth management or you know trading yep. and and you know trading strategies. That's that's the more sexier topic or M&A was very, right. And probably also like a smaller audience market structure. How many people? Yeah, very yeah. small. But what was great about that was I was able to build like really, um, you know, tight relationships with, with folks who um, were at the center of, of that universe of that market. All of the exchange CEOs, I think I interviewed within, you know, six months of me being an intern at business yeah. insider. So the CEO of New York stock exchange, oh, wow. or the president rather the, president of CBOE, the president of, uh, of NASDAQ mm -hmm. at the time, the head of listings at NYSE. And part of that, I think, was because they assumed I was 40 years old, given mm -hmm. given my voice <laughs> the, and, and name. And the mustache, yeah. And I, I didn't have the it mustache. It didn't have it back that, then, yeah. That's a post-bear market, post, I think you started. Yeah, that was in the midst of the, the COVID. Um, so anyway, long story short, <laughs> um, it was interesting because that's the world that first started to adopt crypto on Wall Street very quickly. Yep. The HFT firms and the exchanges, whether it was listing Bitcoin options or HFT firms simply making markets on crypto exchanges. And so it was through that uh, sort of lens that I entered crypto um, technically still at Business Insider, but then more increasingly covering. And was it your first exposure to crypto through maybe like an article you wrote for Business Insider or? It was probably, yeah, it was probably... Um, there was a lot of studies like in early 2017 from yep. like the Deloitte's and KPMG's yep. of the world yep. looking at this topic. So I started covering some of those reports. Mm -hmm. And then again, I started noticing that a lot of these more traditional financial services firms were doing crypto stuff. And so that's how I started covering it through the, you know, through CBOE partnering with yep. Gemini on, on their uh, Bitcoin futures product or, you know, 
Virtu making markets on on that Bitcoin market, et cetera. And so I was writing about Bitcoin as it pertained to firms like Jump mm -hmm. and CBOE yep. and NASDAQ before I even you know had Got any with relationships yeah. with folks from Coinbase or, or Gemini or mm -hmm. Galaxy or Genesis. Uh, but that I have ultimately bridged that gap and kind of like became the crypto exchange trading person um, from a writing reporting perspective. And then one day, yeah, Mike Dudas um, uh, called me up and was like, can you meet at the Beekman Hotel? And he was there sitting. It was very <laughs> shadowy and dark. I think he had a glass of wine. And it was, you know, quarter oh, the after Beekman one. The Beekman is like the super old building, right? With the yeah, it's yeah, got like you can the, look up and the yeah, 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 yeah. I was there recently for the Bullycon Summit. It was super cool. Hotel. Yeah, so that's where we first met. Ominous. <laughs> it was a bit ominous. Um, so then we did that. I I was like, you know what? The, it was the bear market too. But I was like, you know what? I was like, this is the only time. I never understand people who don't want to join startups because mm -hmm. it's like, especially venture back startups, it's like, we raise some money, so we're going to exist for some yeah, period yeah. of time. And if you believe in yourself, you'll at least, at least the way I thought about it. And you're getting was, paid too. It's not just sweat equity. Yeah. 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 I mean, I was like, I'm going to get paid. I'm getting paid more than I did yeah. at Business Insider. Uh, so it was kind of a no brainer for me. I, I mean, for folks who maybe, you know, a lot of folks are in a different position, especially if you're, you're you know, in your 30s or 40s and have built your career. You do have to take that pay cut, which is which is tough. But if if you can keep your salary the same or like just a small cut, I mean, I think it's a no brainer to to work at a startup for at least a few years yeah. because the risk in my mind is outbalanced by the experience that you get and the growth that you can experience in building a company. And then yeah. that's what I did for about four years. I saw the tweet like two days ago where I think they're shopping around Coindesk for $300 million or something like that, where it turns out a crypto media well, company. Well, hey, let me tell you, if that <laughs> turns out to be the case, you'll be the first one invited on my boat. That's right. Okay, so, and that, that led you to the plot. I think that's a rich valuation. I think that would be pretty rich. 300 million for them. Yeah. Let's say on 60 I, I, million I, I, in revenue. I don't have the comps for how much, uh, how much traditional medias are worth but you know ultimately i think there's only very very few meaningful crypto news outlets when you yeah, think sure. about it there's coindesk there's you guys blockworks is starting to post, post more research too morning morning bruce sold to business insider for 75 million I think. oh so okay so then that's that that is rich okay yeah um anyway so, so yes and then that was that was the whole story and it was just it's been four years of of just unbridled fun hard work and it's it's like there's these cycles where I think, okay, now I'm gonna start getting bored by this surely. Whether it's the topic, mm -hmm. the job, and then something just completely radically shifts. Right. And I've gotta like almost it's like a deck up billion dollar embezzlement. Exactly. Boom, it's like back. whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's do this. And, and so then let's let's dive into that because I know and we're gonna dive into some individual stories that happened throughout the years, especially even with you in the block. Um you know, from there was phases where, you know, investigations to Binance, I remember in 2019, where I think the offices got raided that you guys talked about. And then, um, you know, did I, you do your you did your research? Or do I, you remember? I, I just remember you just remember. Okay. I, I've been around, you know, um, but then also, you know, Coindesk this time was the one that broke the story with FTX. Yeah. And so uh, now to, to bring to this, this, this really big topic that I want to cover, because there's multiple parts to it. And kind of get into truth in media because I think this has been a conversation that maybe even started, you know, a lot more hating with Donald Trump, where like fake news, fake news, mm -hmm. right? And then COVID, there was a lot of people questioning truth in media, and now uh, even people that doubted, like said, like, hey, I don't believe in this, I don't believe in that, because that was very political. Now we have a case where it's not political, where we have FTX, all crypto participants say we saw the facts, we saw what happened, and now you have, you know, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, uh, Washington Post, and so forth, write these love letters to SPF and so forth. And so several questions on that. First of all, like, what's your read on the situation? Why is that the case? Is it simply that he paid them all off? Are they so distant from the material that they don't have the actual data to make the correct assessment? How, how does it come to I be? I think that um, this is something that we have an editor at The Block who talks about this topic very eloquently as it pertains to uh, legacy media like Bloomberg. Yeah. And she um, often talks about how people will come up to her at crypto conferences and say, you guys are just so much more accurate, meaning the block, yep. relative to Bloomberg. Bloomberg gets things wrong. And she's like, I'm almost certain 
Bloomberg doesn't get things wrong. They mm -hmm. don't make mistakes. Like the, the rigor of editing, second edit, third edit, you don't make mistakes there. And, and when you do, it's taken very seriously. But the point she makes is that it's not that, that there's inaccuracies in the reporting. It's just missing sort of like a, a, a very hard to describe nuance or connection to a space. There is a slight degree and that that reflects in the sort of the verbiage of certain words, the tone, and I would I would I would sort of I would I would compare that to the dichotomy we see between crypto media on the topic of Sam Bankman Fried and legacy media. It's not it's not so much um, it's not even purposeful. It's just a result of where you sit. So it's it's not even inaccurate. It just seems imprecise when you are so deep in the weeds. It's the same reason why. If you are a technologist mm. and you're or a scientist, right, and you're reading, um, let's say CNN's article on, um, you know, the way combustion engines work, or yeah. or or rocket ships, or quantum mechanics, it's it's going to read. Not, it's going to seem inaccurate, but it's not that it's inaccurate. It's just very surface level relative to like MIT Tech Review. Or but a, isn't or there a, a line between? simplification and falsehood i think that the line is 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 very close or rather the it's a blurred line which which results in in many instances of imprecision or or simplification resembling falsehood now the other thing i would add on the sam thing i think there's a there's a particular um nuance here mm -hmm. is that you know, for for them in traditional media, there is less of a raw sort of emotion about what this person mm. had done. So, because if there's no money exposure, meaning like if somebody didn't lose money on it, they probably care less. It's just another, you know, hedge fund. Another, okay, goes. You know, yeah. fund blows up. Oh, okay. Yeah, and again, it is not that much money to them, right? Like, yeah. you know, I think there's a there's a weird element of of just cryptos, this crazy world. And here's this guy who said that he was going to donate his billions to charity, and now he can't. Yeah. And and that is that's probably the lens through which they're looking at it. But obviously, to us, that comes off as no. This isn't about him wanting to donate money. It's about yeah. this potential crime and the damage he did to all of these people. So it's just coming at it from totally different vantage points. And and I think I think I, I'm not trying to defend necessarily as I am trying to explain. Mm -hmm. To me it's no, just saying, yeah. it's just as bizarre, right? I mean, looking at some of these headlines and and the memes have been fantastic of him being ripped in the Wall Street Journal and and the and the headline being edited to say, you know, oh like he's he, he's so beautiful he's and so jacked beautiful and, and, like jacked I... <laughs> and, and 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 done up well. So, I I I think that that's I think that that's part of it. I mm -hmm. think there's a more um, looking broadly at just like information, right? There's a br people view anything that's not their own truth mm -hmm. as being inaccurate, and that's in business media, uh, political media, especially political news, right? Uh, anything that does not reflect your worldview is fake news, and I think that goes for both sides. Yeah, and so, so I'm curious as a journalist, do you believe the truth even exists, or is everything perspective? I think that it's difficult to sort of it's difficult to appease different groups with a form of news mm -hmm. unless it's directly rooted in, in some sort of data point. But as we know, there's lies, damn lies, and, and data. But, and I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you look at something like NFT Mints, mm -hmm. they're soaring, okay? They're, uh, Solana, they had a peak a few months ago. And the chart just went all the way up to the right. And you can say, you can write an article about how Solana Mints are having a moment, their day in the sun, which would be true. That wouldn't have been inaccurate. And I wrote that story. But as it turns out, um, it was tied to a very specific, um, uh, let's say, I think it was a specific um, new drop or something. Okay. I don't remember the details. Um, and then it, it sort of subsided after right. that drop. So it the story although i didn't say this in the story it could have given the impression that solana was solana nfts were having a moment yeah when it was really just this one 
right. having a moment. And, and so, even data can be manipulated where, for example, I remember back in 2018, um, treating Dapp Radar, Dapp Radar put out a report of like the most used layer one blockchains and EOS and Tron were just like ripping in terms of like how many active wallets, how much usage and so forth. At some point, I think EOS even maybe close to or more than Ethereum were in hindsight, of course, I mean, those were fake. How much yeah. does it cost to set up a wallet? How much does it cost like, you know, deposit? So, and, we, and so the, the thing that I think we have, we, we benefit from here at the block relative mm -hmm. to other media outlets is we can understand that nuance, right? If we're, if I'm looking at a chart of NFT volumes, rewind the clocks. Uh, when was the bull market? I can't remember eight months mm -hmm. ago. Um, a little bit more by now. Unfortunately. You know, I think that us and Coindesk and Decrypt would, would probably more uh, keenly understand that the surge in volume was tied to like wash trading with looks rare. And I'm not saying that like the likes of Bloomberg and fortune wouldn't get to that conclusion, but I think mm -hmm. it would take a bit more sort of digging into it. I, I, I'm not trying to suggest that they get all these things wrong, but I think we can more quickly sort of, okay, obviously that's, that's, that's sort of not, it's not a hundred percent depicting like real activity. And so the story would reflect that. Whereas you could see, you know, maybe someone without that context writing, looks rare overtakes Uniswap or yeah. rather OpenSea. And it's like, okay, but what's actually happening here? Right. Under, there might be under, incentives underneath the hood that cause that. Yeah, exactly. And and that's important. And um, and there's a lot of that stuff. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. you saw the wrapped ETH Bloomberg story about how it was unraveling and it was just tied to a meme and they mentioned it. <laughs> I know, like all like of CT went nuts uh, just making a joke and actually got a lot of its own. And I think for like a day, ETH started like dumping. Really? You know? That's funny. Yeah. yeah. So I think a lot of that is that. Okay. Um, the second one that kind of feeds into that from a, a even big, bigger angle is how much of media, maybe percentage-wise, would you say is actually paid? And I'm saying this coming from the angle, you know, we've, this paid media can come in multiple different angles. You've got, of course, sponsored stories. You have, um, you know, paying a bit boy to do a YouTube video. You can buy your way on stage. Like, I mean, so much of media nowadays, you can buy yourself a front cover in different magazines. How much of what's being portrayed in the media would you say is actually a, a journalist picking up a story saying, this is interesting, let's write about it versus there is, or even heck by now, I'm not gonna name names, but there's a lot of crypto research firms that might've started as, with pure journalism and now you can sponsor research pieces where I can, uh, uh, let's say I'm Project XYZ, I pay them $30,000 and they'll write a report about me, right? Yeah. And so how much of media would you say is still organic? So the the, I think the question most people would want to know is yeah. how many actual journalists yeah. are receiving funds from a company to write about them? I would say I'll take it from me. Yep. I would say there probably that would be less than and I'm hope I'm not being too optimistic, less than three percent of journalists. Really? I mean, you're thinking about a company. So if we're thinking about Fortune, Bloomberg, the yeah. block. New York Times, Wall Street Journal. I mean, their journalists are not taking money directly from entities. I, I would say that would rarely happen. Mm -hmm. You're not going to have Felix pay Frank to have him write. I mean, that's just like, I guess very, yeah. it's just very rare. Now, what happens There's is some the, what outlets people, like, you know, like the Forbes cesspool of like well, contributors Forbes and stuff like that. Well, Forbes has a contributors section, yeah. which I think, I don't know what their, how their scheme works, but yeah. maybe that is paid. But that is different from the reporters who work at Forbes who are writing about crypto. Sure. Like Michael DiCastillo is not like, he doesn't write a story about OpenSea and then OpenSea sends him money in the, in the mail. Okay. Like that's just not really happening. But so maybe not as directly, but maybe let's call it indirectly. Let's say a, a, a crypto firm, yeah, a crypto sure. research firm hosts a big conference and you're the platinum sponsor. And then of course you naturally have a good relationship and you're going to write a lot of nice pieces about each other. Um, I don't know if that's the case because think about it this way. Like we are 170 people yep. um, and there are, I mean, at this point I could probably name 40 people at the block mm -hmm. if, if you held a gun to my head. So there's a whole sales apparatus that are, you know, pitching clients, trying to get advertisers. Mm -hmm. um, I can, you can go through my Slack. I mean, I don't yeah, talk yeah. to anyone in sales or advertising. I don't even know who they are. I don't right. know where they live. I don't know where they work. I don't know what relationships they have. I literally turn on the site just like you and I see ads that I don't know mm -hmm. where they're coming from, how they got there, how much they're paying us, any of that information. I just mm -hmm. have no idea. Most of the time I haven't even heard of 
some of these firms. That's probably why they're, you mm -hmm. know, they want exposure. But there are just, I think like there's this idea that like everyone, because it's different than a normal company, like in a hedge fund, like everyone's trying to trade and make money. Yeah. And everybody has visibility into that. In, in a media company, there are these like very strict sort of firewalls between different divisions where it seems like, you know, Frank is doing the same thing as everybody else within the block, but mm -hmm. like it's it's not. It's it's completely uh, contains multitudes of, of different functions, and a lot of the times those functions don't see each other. Um, I have no visibility into who we're pitching for ads, who, um, with the exception of course of of the podcast, right? Mm -hmm. Because I have to read the ad, of course, of ad, course, of ad, course, uh, ad slots. But we're actually we're moving more towards you know non crypto brands in a way, which which. Um, is a good diversifier for a bear market, but also it, it decreases the it, risk of it, promoting things like FTX, BlockFi that ultimately yeah. lose. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can't really lose money uh, enjoying some delicious athletic greens. That's right. Which is a <laughs> sponsor of the scoop, uh, or uh, well, IWC is no longer a sponsor, so I don't know if I can give them a shout out. That they're getting, they're going. Well, get now they're free, getting a free shout out a here. Free shout out. But do you do you understand what I'm saying? Like, I think that like. Most people who consume media have never worked in a media company yeah. before, and the, and they can't really see how it all works. But it, what you would, I get the, I get the thinking. It's like, well, so I, I guess it, it all it, it comes from multiple angles. Of course, you know that FTX drama on one hand and so forth. But even when I talk to portfolio companies, even people uh, like companies, uh, startups, you know, that we are doing due diligence on for mm -hmm. investments, and what I found is that the startups that have some of the biggest coverage also have the biggest marketing budgets so you know yeah. I, was, I was talking to a startup and that they spent 300k a month on marketing and they're still worth they're still in the eight figure valuation where that's like a massive marketing spend that's more than other companies spend on the entire burn right and yet they also have to be some of the most written about and so i'm curious you know well, how, that does, can, how does that, that flow can, into each other that you know? can be the result of many different things mm -hmm. i mean that could be the result of paying a very um expensive pr firm to like mm -hmm craft these messages i mean i can show you my inbox mm -hmm. like the level of quality between different pitches i mean it's it's likely going i mean there's a there's a wide chasm between bullshit and like a really good email i mean you see that probably in your daily life with yeah, pitches from companies on the other side and one would assume that the the emails or the pitches that are the most well written they sort of tie into some of my previous coverage they're they're you know just like you're asking good questions they're sort of presenting um answers to those questions yep. as it were and i'm assuming that that there's a marketing firm behind that that's getting paid more than the marketing firm behind sure. behind that pitch and so and then to take it one step back that's going to be the the client or company that you're talking about mm -hmm. that has that biggest marketing budget because they can pay the most expensive pr firm that can do the best job that can send the most appealing email and i think it's it seems a bit more insidious but it really is just a function of quality in, in a mm. way and I, I guess in a way, just like people say, you know, if you're able to f pay the best lawyers, you also have a better chance of, you know, winning a trial. For sure. But I also doesn't mean think you paid the judge to win. Ex I, that's a that's a that's a great analogy. But I would also say that it there's also a benefit in being like really gritty and rugged and not and not even employing a PR firm where mm, you're just to, like a yeah. really interesting CEO who can do, you know, not to flatter you, but like standing up a podcast and just like reaching out directly, that goes a long way. Mm -hmm. um, especially since it's it makes it seem more important. You know, mm -hmm. I could get a great pitch and it could actually be really big news, but a direct message from the CEO with just a few lines is always going to just capture my attention more because, mm -hmm. of, of course, CEOs are busy. So if they're yep. taking the time to sort of reach out directly, then it just at least presents to me the appearance of, of something being of high priority. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, it's funny because I think journalists, we, we take this all for granted, mm -hmm. this landscape and don't really take the time to explain it to folks, but um, it, it's, it's a, it's a very, you know, diverse sort of set of circumstances. Like there's, there's the media relations for folks pitching, there's, you know, CEOs sort of being dogged and reaching out directly and then there's stuff that your source network um, sort of tells you. And with Sam, so people think this is the question, right? He's paying off media. Mm -hmm. What he did well was at, like he didn't need to pay off anyone because mm -hmm. he was so effective at, 
you know, what I think a cynical person would call distractions. Okay. Right. Like, come on, how am I not going to write about Miami heat arena being renamed FTX arena? How am I not going to write about him speaking to Congress? Like we have to write these stories. And I think yeah. he it, was very purposefully doing creating things. news for these stories. Yeah. You know? And it's, it's, it's not that he was paying people to write, write this. I mean, I could go do this if I had the money I could, you know, I'd rename, Miami Heat Chaparro Stadium and yeah. uh, journalists would cover that I'm sure or I could go speak to Congress and donate 20 million dollars to congressmen and senators and whatnot um, now I wouldn't really have to pay people to write about that it would just kind of happen um, I also, and so, but but then how does that how does it mechanically happen so he donates to campaigns is it just because it's so big that everybody knows or does it actually well, send public. an email yeah it's but no but that's public i mean that's like public information yeah. i guess it's it has to be so big you know because like let's say in his case like it's it's yeah, the second it's biggest so donor big. to biden it, it gets out it right gets out, yeah. but like if it's something of a smaller scale it would it would seem kind of weird like hey look at me i'm you know donating to campaigns please yeah. write about me right so yeah. it needs to be i guess authentically big where there's probably not even a communication between him and the journalist. The journalist just pick it up. Yeah. The other thing I, I will say, I will say, um, because I don't want to be too, I don't want, I, I don't want to be too apologetic of, of the media since I am part of it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be a bit uh, self-critical. Okay. But I do think there was a stark contrast between the way that Sam Bankman Freed was covered and the way that Brian Armstrong and uh, yeah. Jesse Powell. My theory for that is because tech venture capital journalists are the ones that are covering the likes of Brian Armstrong and 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 Jesse, and they're always I mean they've always been hyper like a hypercritical group for better or for worse right because you know tech companies they try to um, they try to sort of move fast and break things so yeah. you know we, we and and sometimes journalists can be a bit too. Um, maybe aggressive in that respect, but the, you know, at the end of the day, I think most journalists are trying to think about like, how can I think in the, how can I ask questions or approach things in the way that like an investor or like a cynical investor or client of this company would want me to unpack this. And so I think that because those were the journalists covering those two gentlemen, uh, they got a bit more, a bit more critical, uh, view, whereas like Sam kind of entered a more, uh, he wasn't like a crypto guy. He wasn't a Silicon no. Valley guy either. So you had like more generalist reporters covering him. Um, and and those folks, right, if you're writing for, uh, you know, let's say CNN or, or um, you know, something more mainstream, the ho yeah. Hollywood or Vanity Fair, it, they're just going to yeah. cover sort of this, you know. Plus, in a recent interview, I think this was like this, this came out yesterday. He even acknowledged, and that's coming from him, so I'm not trying to make it political. He said that, you know, journalists tend to be more on the liberal side, right? Mm -hmm. And so he, for example, he he kept his Republican donations dark and he made his, you know, Democratic donations very public. And he also made himself very likable, I think, to the archetype that is, um, that, that a lot of journalists are, right? Like, you know, very progressive, you know, doing a lot of charity, vegan, I mean, like all those things, right? And then you've got Brian Armstrong doing um, like less PC things and saying, hey, you can't bring politics to, to the office and so forth. Totally. Which makes and he has a hundred million dollar mansion in L.A. Sam drove a Corolla. Right. Um, yeah, I think that's a fair point. And so if the media isn't uh, as paid as like it is painted to be, what would be your advice for founders to get the attention of journalists? Like because you did bring up the good dichotomy between like, having the best PR from can go a long way, but you also said it's, it also works being rugged and just like, you know, sending that DM, but like, what would it take to, let's say, get your attention? I think, um, <clears throat> I think being someone who's just willing to engage in conversation about topics shaping, um, the news would be one way to sort of just build a relationship. Yep. Um, it's just like a conversation. Uh, if I'm sitting down with someone, you know, you want the conversation to be like 30% about the product they want to shill and like just 40% about normal life stuff. And then maybe talking about competitors or what's going on in the market. Like it's just sort of yeah. um, a, a mixed bag of, of, of topics. And I think that's what I would suggest to founders is just be someone that's like a really reliable um, 
source of, of information and, and discourse, I think, goes a long way. And and that can kind of get you in a position where uh, you can be relied upon mm-hmm. to t- t- kind of chime in on different subjects, even if it's not about you. And then ultimately, you know, the, the person, the reporter will understand you yep. and the company more. And and I think that'll increase the chances of, of a of an announcement of sorts being covered if it sort of meets the threshold of being interesting. Right. Yeah. And I think there is a I think the trickiest part. I mean, we've both crossed that chasm where like you're either in the media or you're not. Right. Where, for example, like, let's say I pitch a you know, let's say I pitch, uh, well, I didn't need to, like, I, people reach out to me about the FTX situation, right? And mm-hmm. I could say, like, oh, I've been on CNBC here, I've been there, 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 validate. Or if you want to look me up, you can. If somebody, like, you know, let's say is a seed stage founder, pre seed founder, and they haven't been in the media, what kind of, I guess, work could they build up so that if you look them up, you're like, okay, there's somebody I actually want to talk to because, you know, um, it's kind of the chicken or the egg. You're not going to get in media um, without having some track record with media, but you can't get that track record with media unless you get into the media, right? Well, I would advise those folks to sort of start small and build it up, right? If you have, I mean, there's tons of companies that have podcasts, right? Mm -hmm. Um, If you're a client of that company or a service provider of that company, try to see if you can get your CEO on it. Like, you know, I imagine, you know, you have folks who are just starting out who maybe are portfolio founders. Yeah, exactly. And they come on this show and then that can set them up because someone like you can send your show to me and be like, Hey, maybe this guy could go on your show or Pomp show, yep. who I think is right yeah, next door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, walking distance. Um, yeah, I think that's like a good strategy. Okay. I love these practical questions of, of how to. Um, uh, well, look, because I, I think there's such a miss that, that there is so much judgment, and, and I, I brought the judgment in the very beginning too. I know, mm-hmm. like, I was like very much like, no, you know, gun fine. against your head, right? That's fine. But, but at the same time, to counterbalance that, you know, people need to know. Well, what is the right way, right? Mm-hmm. It's because I think it's very, very easy. And this is not just with journalism; this is with everything in this world. Where if something isn't working, you're say like, "Oh, the game is rigged. Like mm-hmm. the game's against me." Maybe just because somebody doesn't say yes to have you on your show or say yes to have you on that newspaper, you're like, "Oh, it's rigged. It's all paid for. Whatever." Right? Same thing. Um, you know, a venture fund doesn't invest in you. It's all. Rigged. There's also there's also, and I've been on the other side of this. There's yeah. also just a a, you know. There's so much going on, yeah. and it's trite to say. I don't want to sound trite, but so often it's just a, it's simply routine, yeah. right? So I'm I'm great. I think I do a good job on CNBC, mm-hmm. um, and you know I'm not I'm not super intellectual, <laughs> but I make a, I make a case, and I sort of am very um, predictable, yeah. And I make time for them. Correct. So. I don't think they're asking me on a bunch because I'm fantastic. I'm a fantastic order, um, but it's like okay, reliable. Who, who was like, on? Who was on last week? Okay, Frank. Okay, then the next one. Okay, is Frank? Let's do Frank again, or whoever it is. Like you see these people. Like I think you know someone like, like Sam did that very well because he said yes to everyone. Yeah. And said yes time and time again, almost to the point that it made no sense, which I've, I've talked about, before. Um. But there's other people that do this really well. I think, you know, someone like Jeremy Allaire in D.C., like he's constantly speaking Mm -hmm. there. And I think a lot of the times these folks that organize these hearings, they're like, okay, who's just the person that has done it before who says yes or is reliable? Let's have them do it again. And then they do it again. And then they do it again. And it's the same thing, I think, with like even with my podcast, you know, when I'm when I hit a bind, I have to do three a week. I'm thinking, okay, who are the folks who have been on the most? Yeah. So and and then say yes and and can do a quick turnaround, and it's folks like you know who have been on the most, like Josh Lim, mm-hmm. uh, Kristen Smith, Sam Bankman-Fried. They've all come on a lot, or yep. I've invited them back on a bunch because they constantly are are saying yes, and they can they can be booked within a day, and and Kristen Smith is, isn't paying me, nor is nor is of Josh course, Lim, yeah. but they. You didn't say or the Sam. Sam or Sam. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but gotcha. but there's a level. Yeah, exactly. Touche. Um, but there's a level of um, just it, speed, right, and yeah. predictability that I think goes in that. So that's another. That's almost another practical tip. Like, if you can, especially for podcasts, like if you or or just booking appearances, if you're just someone who can can do that um, and who's comfortable with it, like the more predictable you are, the the more you're going to be invited back just as a function of 
you know, I've got to, yeah. yeah, I've got to get this done. I got to fill this slot. That's especially the case with TV because I see it all the time. I sometimes, you know, after certain appearances, I'm like, they really want me back. And it's probably just because I say yes. Yeah. And, and probably give, you know, good answers, you know, where yeah. they're like, Hey, we, this is something that you've been reliable. You show up, you always reply. And I think speed of reply is important too. You know, mm -hmm. I, I really stayed out of the media until this year. And then I had, um, doing the tariff fiasco, you know, mm -hmm. we, we, I made a, a connection with a CNBC reporter, Tanaya. And we've, and then, then what happens? It, she comes every, back and you're, yeah. and you're not paying We her. text at least like once, once a yeah. month, you know, it's like, Oh, what's your thought on Celsius? Oh, what's mm -hmm. your thought on Blockfile? What's, what's, you know, and it's simply easy kind of call sometimes something gets published sometimes not maybe sometimes i say something stupid and then it's like i, I i'm not, I'm not gonna yeah. put that in story right yeah but no that makes sense um how do you balance truth and speed um breaking stories obviously well, that's like the, the place where you stand out as a journalist and you get the clicks um but at the same time also there's been many times when things get out too fast and then are inaccurate um <clears throat> so there's a lot of stuff to unpack here um, I think the, the, the question can be rephrased as what is more important, um, being fast or being accurate, mm -hmm. almost like the Machiavellian question of, is it better to be feared or loved? Oof. Um, Love this. I'd rather people fear how fast and accurate I am now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that, uh, accuracy is, is far more important than speed. Um, speed is important in as much as you want to be first, mm -hmm. um, you don't want things to be rushed though. That's the difference. Mm. You want to just be first. And that is, that is super important, but, but not being, not sort of, you know, being inaccurate, not, not to the extent that you, you, you have to, ju uh, um, you have to sort of, um, not be accurate to, to be fast. Okay. You can be, you can sort of, um, to, to, to do it right. You know, we, we, we've implemented it like almost a speedy system where we get the first takeout. And so it's a short story that hits the news. We have a reporter on it who this is their beat. So they understand the context of what's happening and it gets an edit. It gets a quick second edit and goes out hopefully within eight minutes, 10 minutes, sometimes less, and then a back read after it's out. Um, and so that's the process, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, with, with stories that are less timely, like they'll go through several edits, like at the block at this point, we, we can probably stories are run through four edits. Some, in some cases, sometimes five and oh, there's in, in, what, in what time frame in a day, in a day. Right. Yeah. Or maybe two days, depending on how timely it is, maybe three days, maybe four. Um, and there's no perfect science to a lot of this, but if you can get sort of, um, you know, different tactics in place. It makes it easier. You know, one thing that we do, and I think a lot of newsrooms do is we create shells for, mm -hmm. for certain stories. Um, Did this is shells or shows shells shells okay. or, or what, what's the other word we use? I call them shells, but some people call them, um, there's another word for them, but it's basically like a, a prepared story for an event that we expect to happen. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, block fi uh, filing for bankruptcy was a story we anticipated and probably wrote a shell for yep. in the event that that news happens. So that helps with speed. Obviously we wait for the information to come, mm -hmm. we digest it, we input it, and then we put it out. Um, but those are just, you know, different tactics that we use. And, and where do you get your info from as a journalist? You know, people, let's say funds. So we do our research by reading, you know, the blog, Masara, Delphi, of course, primary information too. But where, where do you, if you are the one writing for the first time about something, where do you usually go to? There's a mix of different sources, right? Uh, there's filings, there's corporate filings, mm -hmm. which are very helpful. There's public records and documents. Um, there's primary individual sources. And we go through this. Um, one of the edits is actually like almost a sourcing edit. Mm -hmm. Who uh, told you this? How do they know? And it's rigorous and it can yeah. be, it can be almost like, you know, I think people don't understand how like r rigorous it can be in terms of like, even I get pushback, right? Mm -hmm. If I say a source is telling me X yep. and I believe in the source, but the editor thinks that they're too removed from the story or the source of information, they're going to push back and say, you need a sort like it's almost like, you know, when you see a priest and he says, okay, do 10 Hail Marys, like the editor will do the same thing. Like, mm -hmm. okay, no, you need to find someone who works in this department. Yeah. It gets that granular. You need to find someone who worked 
in the yacht store that Suzu went to, not the guy right. who works with him at the car dealership. I don't know. I'm mm-hmm. making things up. But that's like that's the level of like diligence that we do with sourcing where you, you get homework and it's like, okay, I don't and and it's the editor's call. Like there have been moments where I'm like, no, I absolutely know that this guy knows. But the way we've structured it is such that it's that it's the editor of the story's call. And that's a really good balance of power because the journalist has the motivation to put his story out or her story out mm-hmm. because that's what that's where the glory is, right? Right. And, and, the, and to, to clarify again, with, as you're all, you are the editor at large, which means you're the one that can veto. You're the one that says, no, we need a better source or we're not publishing the story. It depends, right? Okay. I mean, it depends. If I'm editing a story, typically with my role, I'm actually – helping reporters report out the story. Mm -hmm. So there's still an editor. So I almost come in, I swoop in, let's say someone, you know, we were working on a story about um, Wang, right? Gary Wang. That was Gary Wang, yeah, like the the, the the unknown co-founder. So I rang up like various investors in FTX. There was another reporting reporter on the story, but Mm -hmm. I kind of had the sourcing. So I called up folks and was like, and asked what was this Gary character like? helped with the reporting of that story, but we still had an editor yep. who was who, you know, asked me, where is this information coming from? How do they know? What's their connection? Okay, that th- I was asked that one was really solid. Mm-hmm. So they didn't push back. I was like, this is this this person definitely knows all these these details about this man. Uh, but that's how it works. Yep. You know, and for me, no, I mean I on the weekends I, I edit our site, so I would be the one to veto or not veto. Mm-hmm. Um but no, I don't have, it's actually quite funny. Like it, I don't have veto power. I can't say if I have, cause I'm going to have a line of editors. We, everyone does. Yeah, yeah. Even the editors have editors. It's like that SpongeBob, you know, episode where he's like, do all, do you, are you a mailman? Does someone else deliver your mail? Oh. Is there a never ending <laughs> chain of mailman delivering mail to other mailman? We try to have a big chain like that at the mm-hmm. block. So no one, no one is, you know, the executive editors, if they put out a story, the the regular editors, the reporters, the senior reporters, everyone's going through this robust process of yeah. of editing. And, I'm, and I'll be honest, sometimes it is annoying because I want to get the story out. But it's good to have those those checks and balances because it's always better to be safe than sorry, right? Um, that's the, that is the business in which we operate a business of, of trust and it can be destroyed very easily, yep. very quickly and relentlessly. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, I think we, we are, we're, we're very conservative in that respect mm-hmm. in a way that, um, I, I, I feel so confident every day that unlike when we were smaller and nimbler like I, you know you don't really know what fires are going to be needed to put out it's an it's a smooth operating machine and i rarely am troubled or stressed that we're going to fuck up in some major way because yeah. we just we've got it's like you know a mcdonald's hamburger not having pickles on it like it's just the system is in place the system works i i think i i i agree and i disagree to an extent because i think there's reputation can be burnt on very fast but at the same time i think media companies have a lot of Lindy effect where let's let's take Forbes as an example. Forbes has misstepped so many times, like putting Theranos on the front page, putting Sam on the front page, putting a lot of scammers, you know, and like there's been some really weird like under 30 selections and stuff like that, but somehow still one of the biggest names. I don't know what's going on with the 30 list because they won't put me on. So you still got a couple might, years, I right? Might, I might be biased in that respect. You've been on it, haven't I you? I have not been on it. Oh, no. I thought I thought you would. I was on the I was on the liquidity 30 under 30. Oh, which that's is right. Way that, more important. That's, well, so that's funny, right? How funny is that that that's way more important? <laughs> because you know times change, right? I literally had like um, institutional allocators like no, email w- me and congratulate me. They're like, oh, I saw you on the liquidity 30 and 30. I'm like, what? you follow that account? <laughs> and they're like, of course we do. It's the most important account <laughs> to follow. Um, so, I mean, that that's it's the same with the Forbes 30 under 30 that people think it's paid. But what it really is, is I, Frank Chaparro, go pay the best fucking PR firm in the world mm-hmm. to submit my application. And it's just like anything else. It's just like, you know, 
kids in high school when they're doing the SATs, the person who has the really expensive tutor is going to do well. Now, if I was Forbes, you could say, maybe you have to have the individual submit the application or something. Or maybe there's some element that, that is more directly, I don't know how you would do that, mm -hmm. right? Because you could just have someone do your home. I mean, maybe you apply like in a, in a you know, in person <laughs> with your ID, but that's how, that's what it is. Like mm -hmm. when you see like people, it's like that you think shouldn't be on the list. Well, they've got a great, great firm or, or, you know, PR firm, or, you know, maybe someone like you who has, or, you know, you know, the folks that you know mm -hmm. can go to bat like a Mark Yusko or something, you know, people who have the cachet, they could submit an application. So it really is about, you know, the who you know and who yeah. you can who you can pay. But I don't, I don't think Forbes is being paid directly for those slots. Yeah, no, I, I, I doubt uh, that part. But, but the missteps. It takes one leak and that would go public, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, I don't I don't I don't know. I mean, everyone, you know, there but for the grace of God go I. Um, I think it boils down to like I said at the top of the conversation, mm -hmm. just not being involved in it. And this is way more of a problem in 2018 because mm -hmm. you kind of have reporters who are not on the crypto beat kind of coming in for certain stories and they just miss a lot of nuance. And that's yeah. expressed in like phrases and narratives that like don't, that aren't rooted in reality for crypto. One of which is, well, now there's two with the mm -hmm. Sam situation is, well, if crypto is regulated, and it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And you see this in the media, you know, unregulated, the unregulated crypto market. And it goes back to the point I brought up at the beginning, which is that's not inaccurate, but it's also not accurate. Like yeah. there's there's a nuance there. Coinbase is regulated as much as it reports to New York Department of Financial Services. Right, because but it's onshore. It's, it's the onshore. regulation that pushed all the but, but perps even, and stuff out. Even even FTX was regulated by the Bahamian Monetary Authority or whatever it's called. For what that is worth, yeah. For what that's worth. So it's like it is regulated, but it's, it's, it's the word we should use is the poorly regulated, poorly regulated. crypto industry. Not the un, because it's not un, there's regulations. There are certain and ill-fitting regulation, misguided regulation, misguided and regulation. That, yeah. yeah, and the words are important, right? Um, so, but, but yes, you're even seeing with the FTX debacle, like I think Liz Warren put out an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal and the head of the CFTC came out and said, if we implemented these policies, okay, no, because <laughs> they were not based in the United States, sir. What, what, what could you have done? Um, so there's just, it's just misunderstanding. It's yeah. not being super, you know, I can't, I, you know, sometimes I prognosticate about topics about which I'm not an expert and mm -hmm. I'm, I probably sound a bit out of touch to folks who do this every single day. I think we do this a lot in crypto. One month we're uh, <laughs> pandemologists, then we are, um, you know, geopolitical experts yeah. and everything, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I got another question in, in, in that line and then I want to cut over a little bit more to the culture and also like narratives of crypto. Um, coming to incentives, this has been a, this was a big conversation, I think back in like 2018, I remember. I think in the early days, the block did not allow you guys to hold crypto assets. Mm -hmm. And then there came a time when you guys had to disclose them. And I remember re uh, checking the disclosures. So I was like, the fuck? A lot of you guys like barely hold any crypto. <laughs> and some yeah. of you guys only hold Bitcoin. And I know Selkis was always in the opposite camp from Sorry, He was like, we are one of the only companies that lets our writers hold crypto. And I've also noticed that over the years, I think most of the block journalists now have more crypto exposure it's been and and as a result i would i don't know maybe that's the wrong word i don't want to pull a conclusion but it does seem that the the tone has become a lot more pro crypto in those years where there was a lot more criticisms in the yeah past. well so here's where i think i don't think so there the, the overarching ever, I don't question think there being was... like incentives meaning if you like do you think holding an asset that you write about is negative or positive or impact the way you write because at the same time, not holding, aka a lot of the Bloomberg guys out there, um, not holding an asset is also position. Meaning if you're if everything's going up and you're not allowed to hold it, are you gonna be a fan of it? Probably not. You're gonna be pissed. You're gonna be like, this thing is a bubble. I'm not partaking, so it must be crashing at some point. It's a very interesting question. And I don't I don't I don't know if we ever we I don't think we ever had a, a policy against um, holding tokens. I think it was maybe something around trading, but the the way we think about this topic, let's compare it to Bloomberg, right? Which yep. I think their folks are only allowed to hold GBTC and other security instruments tied to the space mm -hmm. or ETFs tied to the space. If you cannot, like, obviously, we have parameters around um, trading 
on news, of course. Sure. Trading, I think you have to hold at least for a month. Uh, and this is a whole new set of guidelines, which is on our site. Mm -hmm. It outlines exactly what we can and cannot do. We cannot flip tokens. We cannot obviously take tokens from other parties, uh, as it were. But just in, let me, let's just think about what a blanket ban means, the mm -hmm. ramifications of that. That means you never know what it's like to log on to OpenSea and to bid on an NFT. Mm -hmm. You can't experience that UX. You can't really appreciate like the floor price versus the prices you can sort of enter to bid. You can't see it. So when you report on it, you're reporting on a black box, yep. right? When you write about wrapped ETH and you've never actually wrapped ETH, yeah. there's a there's a chasm there. When you write about an order book or, you know, different order types, a trading, DeFi platforms. DeFi platforms, and you've never actually submitted a market buy of, of compound or something, then there's like a gap in, in your ability to sort of appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because in in other industries, like you're, and of course there is a, there, we can get on the flip side of this, mm -hmm. which is financial incentives, but just thinking about usage, uh, Amazon reporters use Amazon probably sure. a lot. Yeah, and yeah. they use Apple reporters, use Apple products every day. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're not allowed to own stocks. And that's where it gets a bit confusing. So I think as long as we're like appropriately measured in our ability to engage with the market, it will inform our, our understanding of how these things work and then our ability to report. And to ensure that incentives aren't misaligned, we, we do have sort of these trading caps, basically can't trade. Mm -hmm. um, and then everything needs to be disclosed. And if there's a, you know, if you have a certain position of a certain coin, you're not you're not permitted to write about it, and I think that's oh, the, really okay. That's the key thing. Um, but but doesn't it kind of go against it? Where let's say, for example, somebody is a, you know, we had a lot of those last year with Luna Bulls. You know, somebody had like 100 percent of net worth in the Luna token because they thought it was the best thing ever, and but as a result, they also knew the ecosystem better than anybody else, and so they probably would have been well educated to write about it, but probably biased. Well, I think in that case, like we definitely. Uh, on the research side, and I, yeah. I, and that falls also into the whole like discussion, into, like tribalism, where it's like there's of course maxis on all fronts. Yeah, and we have you know wide range of opinions. I don't I don't run research, mm -hmm. so I can't speak to that without maybe getting in trouble by my colleague Larry Cermak. But what I would say on the research side is I know that there's constant gut checking. So if if the if someone is writing about it, you know. A, a particular corner of the industry that someone else is an expert on, they they'll weigh in and sort of you know share notes on that respect mm -hmm. and and uh, sort of reach the most accurate conclusion. Um, but but no, I think it's an important question and like I'm this is the one thing that I think should constantly be um, talked about and examined, right? Um, and hopefully. You know, I think we have the perfect science, but mm -hmm. I'm sure it will continue to evolve, and and it has evolved, right? And we continue to make it more robust, right? We we have in there stuff about you know crypto linked stocks, which weren't mm -hmm. really a thing when when we first got into this industry, right? Yep. So we wouldn't have even had a policy for that. Coinbase had an IPO yet. Silvergate was not really that well known as a crypto bank, and yeah, MicroStrategy hadn't bought Bitcoin yet. Yeah, yeah they were still doing their their whatever they Software. do. Software. <laughs> no one knows what they do. Well, I don't know. Yeah. I uh, that's firm. Interesting. Talk MicroStrategy. That kind of like rolls us into like the culture part. I want to discuss a little bit. Um, he was in this industry for a long time too. And for some reason, the crypto industry loves to defy people, whether that was a Zuzu, an SPF, a Doquan. Well, Mashinsky did it more so to himself. Nobody really saw him <laughs> that much as a deity. Um, but why is it that we turn That's these really people- That's really funny. <laughs> yeah, how he, he, loves, he loves himself. Jeez. Um, why is it that we put these people on such pedestals and really reinforce it as a community? So, Let's think about this for a second, right? In a in an industry that is very small mm -hmm. and that is viewed very skeptically by the outside, when you have these proponents that are are sort of the defenders of the faith, as it were, mm. it's helpful in a bull market because they they kind of give you that hope and that that sort of resolve to um, 
you know, not feel too silly about something you're devoting your life to. Mm. So that's the explanation I would have for it. It's an incredibly dangerous thing. I actually asked Doquan about this when he came on my show. I said, what was is this it? before or after? This was very uh, shortly before. Okay. And I asked him, I actually, I have to admit, I don't remember what he said, so forgive me, but I did ask him, what does it feel like to be a cult of personality um, in this space? I, I think I asked the same thing of Charles Hodgkinson, mm -hmm. and he was very offended by that, as a matter of fact. I think he thought, I, I didn't, it's not a negative connotation, yeah. it is what it is. But it, it's something that I think is dangerous, mm -hmm. because, I mean, if you look at all of the most of them are not standing. I mean, maybe Vitalik, but Vitalik is, is one exception of someone who has not yet died of, or not yet become a villain before his death, right? The old and expression. He, I think he's the only one that doesn't also egg it on further, right? Where so folks, I'm like, yes, people will defy him, but at the same time, he's not asking for it, right? Like Doe or Hodgkinson or Zuzu, they will make tweets to even like, you know, you know what's the what's the word like you know sit in the sun and like and, and enjoy it and even like make people highlight them more yeah i mean and that was if if we think about the the undercurrents of this crisis it was it was not just the lack of um collateral issues or the lack of or rather the lack of proper collateral sort of standards lack of counterparty risk management a lack of um you know, sort of corporate discipline. Mm -hmm. But the fourth thing, and and maybe the most um, um, key yep. domino was this deification of crypto individuals. Because think about it, it it's it's at the center of all these other issues. We would yeah, we would have doubted Luna. We yeah, would have doubted yeah, three arrows. Yeah. If I'm if I'm a lending firm, why am I going to not think that Suzu's good for the money? Well go look at his Twitter. He's he's this he's this larger than life character if i'm any of these investors that invested in ftx sequoia or let's say let's say a later investor let's yeah. say like i think it was ontario P teachers pension yep. fund oh, well come on i mean sequoia he's in sequoia, yeah. sequoia yeah. invest a tiger he's in front of senate yeah stadium yeah but but so then that kind of ties into what we discussed a little bit earlier do you think is this deification done by the people or is it really just a very carefully crafted pr strategy that these people made themselves into gods it's a really good question i think it happens almost accidentally in certain cases mm -hmm. and then it sort of just becomes like anything that um gets your your sort of endorphins running like mm -hmm. when you start running you enjoy it you want to run more but you don't start out running thinking you're going to be some sort of olympiad mm -hmm. now sam's interesting right I asked him on my show once about the shoe situation where he had them tied all to the left or something and it became like this internet meme. Do you remember that? I just don't know. And okay. it was, you know, everybody was talking about Sam's shoe okay. for days. And I asked him, I was like, is this shit on purpose? Like, do you do this to kind of incite a, a memory or a mm. you know, cascades of memes? And he said no. I don't know if I believe him mm. in hindsight because it all seemed, and the New York Times a few years ago or a year ago hinted at this, that a lot of the mannerisms were kind of put on and such. I think there was a bit of sort of calculation behind I'm going to be this weird guy because think about what was made public and what wasn't. The Toyota Corolla was made public, but not the penthouse. But not the penthouse. Et cetera, et cetera. The weird shoes, but not the fact that the employees are getting $200 DoorDash uh, stipends a day. So it does seem like there's a bit of, you know. Engineering. A bit of engineering. Well, that's an, that's and even Do Kwan has said this himself, that he puts on some sort of like, he said this on my show, like the way I act online is nothing how I am in person. I'm a demure sort of, you know, short, you know, quiet person. A nerd almost, I think would be words that he would use. So, I mean, he's, he's even admitted. I, I, I would say he's not, I mean, 
he's not. So I, I put him at the bottom of, of the mm-hmm. list. You know, we don't really know the full extent of what these people did, but they've all kind of been grouped together in this like yeah. This yeah, league. I would, I would say this Doe league of, probably just got ahead of himself. He was a little too ambitious yeah. and like did that math, but you know, he didn't. I don't think he misrepresented or lied about anything. Um, at least that's been that's been my observation take so far. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've I've talked to him before. I we we were big Luna holders. We sold before the crash, but um, it's it's certainly different than Zuzu, who lied to creditors. Up here, it appears, and FTX, where there's, I mean, a whole host of issues. Host of issues, right? Do you think? And uh, one I wrote down to is Elon and Twitter. Elon kind of falls into this category too of people we've deified. Of course, certainly more. Um, a lot more deservedly than a lot of these other people since he is the richest man on earth he's built tesla spacex and so forth um to i guess twofold question one do you think somebody like kim can fail because all the people we've seen rise too close to the sun they ultimately fail and then two um with the acquisition of twitter since twitter is so closely tied to journalism good or bad observation so far mm. oh, that's a that's a thorny one isn't it yeah so do I think the acquisition is going well? Um, I don't know about this this blue check thing. It doesn't mm. really make much sense to me. I'm not seeing a lot of folks get it. It also is completely fudged up like the the Fake at least accounts. at least the filter. Like now it's like I'm confused about the authenticity of someone even more because I get the blue check notification. I'm like, oh, is this like an investor or journalist? And it's like crypto dork 69 who had just got a blue check. So as a blue check user, you know, in in, in my ivory palace, you know, it, it kind <laughs> you of peasants. It's kind of made the experience a bit worse. Um, but I do. I think there's a valid there's a valid um, point of having everyone verified in that way, and then for like public officials for you know, senators, congressmen, high-level um, diplomats, just to know that they're like the official account and, yeah. and sort of like a business account, for instance, there should be like a different tier of sorts. But I think the way he's framing it is like giving the power to the people. I think it, it works with his audience. Um, but the underpinning principle of just requiring people to to pay so that, they, that you're known to be... Um, who you are now. not important well now well, but, it's but more about who you are that, that you are but who that's you say that, you but are. that's not accurate because at the to get the check mark there is no kyc i mean you can you can kyc uh, oh really no so that i makes mean it anons, more, anons that makes are it... verified um through the through the new service yeah you just pay the eight dollar subscription and you don't need to show your id nothing no. so then that makes no sense What's no because you've got annals verified you've got parody accounts verified fake accounts verified everything well yeah no that's yeah this this makes no that makes no sense yeah. to me I would understand if you like wanted to show that you have given Twitter proof of your identity. Yeah, that makes sense to me because it kind of maybe makes other accounts know that you're real, gets you more engagement, et cetera. And yeah, some people would pay for that. But uh, going back to just him as a, as a person, um, I think it's, it's interesting. We have these cult of personalities that have these big followings, but you know, Elon is unique in as much as, there's not that many people have just as many folks who despise his existence as those who thinks he's the bee's knees. Um, we'll see. I hope he does well by it. I hope he uh, doesn't destroy this thing that I've spent so much time on. Uh, but we'll see. Crypto Town Square. Is there any any crypto companies you think will still fail? That will still fail. Um I think that the the contagion is getting close to finishing. Mm-hmm. I think that you will see maybe a few more le- few lenders are in trouble, right? Mm-hmm. Like Genesis, no doubt. London had some layoffs, um, but there are still some that seem strong. Blockchain, um, Falcon X. Mm-hmm. So hopefully the contagion doesn't spill over into them. But I think I think we're close. I think we're getting close. I mean, we haven't seen a lot of funds announce that they've been hit really hard. So maybe that could be one source of yeah. Further I mean, I feel like spreading. With no latest, but like December thirty first. You know, a lot of funds if they wind down to do the fiscal year. 
Yeah. And there was, you know, Amber got hit pretty hard, where then also one of the That's co-founders right. yeah. passed away. Um, you know, Ikigai got hit 90%, Galois got hit, hit 50%. And I mean, if you're down that much, you know, how you much does to, it make sense to... Yeah, you have to shut down. Do, do you have any particular insights on DCG and Genesis, since that's still kind of like the perhaps the hottest issue on the table? I think that is the biggest story right now. And, you know, the question here is if they can create some sort of deal structure where they can convince an investor to help fill the Genesis hole, which I think is a billion dollars or close to it. And I think they've got some value in the assets that they have. Like Grayscale is still a, you know, on the most conservative end, a $250 million a year business. You put a, you know, slap a 5X on that. Why not? Um, Coinbase, or excuse me, Coindesk is making $60 million in revenue mm -hmm. a year. That's nothing. So if you can maybe cut out some of that and get some get some sort of outside interest and Barry gives up a little bit of his, of his empire, I think there's an ability for him to to fill that hole. And, and that's not even thinking about the, the actual assets, assets that they hold. Mm -hmm. This is just it from the companies. I think there's enough in grayscale for them to sell a chunk of, you know, 30, 40% and Coindesk, you know, something similar and, and they could sort of get there and then maybe, maybe bring some outside uh, investors into DCG itself, okay. which I think Barry owns uh, mm -hmm. the vast, the vast majority because they, they even use some of the loans to buy back DCG stock, yeah. right? Yeah. On a scale of zero to 100 on both, one, how high do you think the chances that there was FTX like misusage of funds so for example let's say grayscale used gpc funds a bit the bit the bitcoin and like lend it out to genesis or and so forth and then the secondly on a scale of zero to 100 oh, I, I planked on the second one but we'll start well, with the first one. One, oh, I oh, think... oh, the second one was the unwinding of the the trusts oh no 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 i don't think that th so the trusts will be like you're asking if they would be liquidated at some point or like right or like even like optional redemption or because because they haven't been able to be redeemed no but there is, i don't i think I don't, the rec m filing enables them to allow it i would put that at a very very low chance of happening i don't think there was misappropriation of funds either i think there was just an incredible lack of like counterparty risk management and 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 risk management within genesis capital mm -hmm. um but I don't think there was anything sort of, it was more mismanagement than any improprieties of, of the sort of, or the like of FTX. Got it, because there, are, there were several loans between both Genesis and DCG both ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess, you know, the, the, the GBDC discount reflects it. You know, even even after Cathy Wood started buying up, where I think we're back down to a new low where- <laughs> Oh, ETH, really? Yeah, ETH was yesterday trading back at like, I think minus 46%. Jeez. Because um, yeah, I think not, it bottomed at 42, went back to like 39 and back down to 46. And so at this point you're almost down half. And so how much more info do we need for that to recover? And if, they, if they're never redeemable, you know, why, why would they? At that point, it's a purely market dynamic situation where unless there's more buyers to push this price up, you know? It can go to zero. Technically, at least, technically. But at that point, I, I would guess these two would just buy up everything and unwind it and, you mm -hmm. know, capture all that that, that upside. Um, final question for you to kind of wrap this up. Um, narratives, what kind of excites you these days? Are there any new angles that come across your desk where you say, you know, I feel like every single cycle, every single year, there's something new where 2020 DeFi was the, the hot thing, 2021 NFTs and metaverse and multi-chain, all these things really happened last year. Is there something maybe completely new that you say, hey, this could actually lead to the next bull market or even for getting bull markets is something that just is really unique, interesting and excites me that um, I want to learn more about. Well, there's there's a few things here, I think. What's super cool to me is a lot of the folks who have left like these now beleaguered crypto centralized brokers and exchanges, yep. a lot of them are going to start companies in DeFi. Ooh, okay. Um, so I know of at least three that are moving on and starting their own yep. DeFi companies who came from the centralized crypto world. So there's um, there's obviously people who got burnt, I think like investors in particular, but a lot of the folks that like operate in this industry, you know, the majority of them are sticking around and, and doing something more in the in the vein of decentralization. Um, the the second thing I'd say is just the whole the way that the capital markets and crypto restructure themselves yep. will be fascinating to watch. Which lenders will step in to fill the gap? How will they be different? What different types of you know self regulatory frameworks might we have implemented to prevent 
sort of a, a credit crisis like we've seen? Um, and what will the regulators do to contribute to that? So those are two fairly interesting things, this new wave of entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. the restructuring of crypto's capital markets. And an extension of that would be to what degree is DeFi playing a role in the new crypto capital markets? Um, how many firms will operate at the bleeding cutting edge of like Maple and Clearpool mm. and the rest as opposed to a more centralized broker? And from what I hear, if you think of like a really cutting edge firm like Framework, if they were doing a lot of their lending on on uh, a Genesis, I would I could see them going like way deep into the direction of like doing most of that stuff on a DeFi platform because mm -hmm. they're they're really at the cutting edge of that. So that's going to be really interesting for me, or at least what I'll be watching. And I feel more positive than ever, at least in the past month. You know, the day the news hit, it was almost like, what the fuck's going to happen next? Yeah. It's time to time to brush up the resume, but I've never been, <laughs> I've never been more positive, um, um, and positive in like a constructive way, not in an exuberant like FOMO to the moon way. That obviously was the trappings of of excessive hubris and greed, um, which is different from how I feel right now, which is more um, a type of tough times make for strong men, make for mm. make for, makes for interesting. Uh, developments. I love that. Yeah. Are there any dark horse players you would bet on where you say 2017 Binance was in beta and just launched and became the biggest behemoth, you know, for better or worse, FTX was a newcomer in 2019 and then became that behemoth. Is there anybody you say like, hey, after that, now that the dust is settling, these are firms that might have been B league before, but I believe can be, you know, the, the big winners in the mm. future. We actually have I have a whole list. Really? I okay. do. I don't know where it is. It's somewhere in this device. Okay. But you're thinking about like, um, like who can sort of like fill in these gaps that have been left, right? Like these so, big names, whether it's a centralized exchange, a lender, or like, it could be protocol. Yeah, or yeah. I mean, I think like something like Aptos, right? Mm -hmm. In a post like Luna Solana dominated world, mm -hmm. can maybe take some market share in that respect. They're an up and coming name. I'm not saying that they'll get to the yeah, size yeah. and scope of the of the of the former, but I certainly think they're one to watch. Um, there's also, um, you know, now that a lot of these lenders have been blown out, does that leave an opportunity for a firm like Falcon X, which yep. was kind of smaller, to step in and increase their market share? If you look at, then there's like something like Maple, which yep. is operating decentralized lending. Can they step in and fill that gap there? And then this this whole new wave of, of um, you know, new crypto startups that are coming. I mean, my, my job is to kind of make sure I keep track of all of them yeah. because you never know who's going to be that behemoth one day. So um, th there's some I know in stealth that, you know, will yeah. be ones to follow. Um, but this was great. Amazing. You know, thank, thank you, you so much, much for having me. Uh, for, thank for you so much for here. being on the show. Of course. Uh, this was super insightful, a completely different angle than usually. Usually we just talk about like indeed the investing aspect or the metaverse aspect. And so whole fresh voice. I love it. And well, I could have I could have told you uh, how you red pilled me on the metaverse before really? um, I ever took it seriously, and if I had gotten started when you tried to red pill me, I would maybe uh, maybe be on the beach somewhere sipping a mai tai. Um, well, but it was still early. You, you were right, I think, um, in a lot of those principles, and um, even still, even in the aftermath of sort of the the the, the peak, I think that. I mean, Facebook changed its name to Meta. I remember I thought, I was like, this Metaverse, was, Felix was telling me about it in like 2018. I was like, this guy's crazy. But maybe you're not still turning, crazy. Not maybe turning still, back the clock on that one. Yeah, crazy. Um, well, I think being crazy can be an advantage. And so <laughs> with that, thanks for being on thanks. and look forward to having you back on the show maybe yeah, a year from now. Definitely. Awesome. Great.